All right. So we're going to continue right on where we left off on Tuesday, which is that we'd started to talk about systems of linear equations and solving them. And then some related questions. I mean, is there a solution? How many solutions are there? So that sort of presents the, the idea behind the method we're going to learn. Um, some systems are easy to solve. I mean, in the extreme case, we might have a system That looks something like this. 1x1 equals 2. 1x2 equals 7. 1x3 equals negative 4. I mean, this is a perfectly valid system of linear equations. And its solution, you can just read right off. Two comma seven comma negative four. So that's the first observation. I mean, the second observation is that we can algebraically modify or manipulate systems without changing their solutions. And the precise things that we're allowed to do will talk about in a moment, but say we have two x1 equals eight, x2 equals three, x3 equals negative one. I mean, saying that two x1 equals eight is the same as saying that x1 equals 4. So we can replace the statement 2x1 equals 8 with the statement x1 equals 4. And now that we have done that, we can read the solution off just like we did in the previous frame. So the idea of solving systems of linear equations follows right on from this. We'll just, I shouldn't say just, but we'll learn the process of algebraically manipulating a system until it becomes easy enough to solve. And that process is called Gaussian elimination. Um, we'll, we'll follow the textbook in um, talking about the things we're allowed to do to a system now. And it's a relatively small pool. 
I mean, if you compare this to solving an equation in algebra, where you could add or subtract or multiply or divide or take logarithms or take exponents or take square roots, we've got quite a small pool of things we can do to systems. Um, that's because most of the things we might do to an equation will make it non-linear. If we start with a linear equation and square both sides, we no longer have a linear equation. And two of the things we can do are quite quite rudimentary, I would say. When we're working with systems of equations, order doesn't matter. So if we want to rearrange them, we can. And then, and this is what I did in the previous frame, we can multiply an equation by a non-zero constant. Uh, over here, I framed it as division, but I multiplied both sides by a half. The third is a little more complicated. We can multiply an equation by a constant. and then add it to a different equation. And this is, um, you know, in algebra, in college algebra, you have an equation, you can multiply both sides by a constant, that's this number two, or you could add the same thing to both sides. In linear algebra, adding the same thing to both sides um, is trickier because if you do it in a naive way, you'll break your linearity. I mean, when we defined, when we defined linear equations, we said we want the variable terms on the left and the constant terms on the right. So if we just did something like add negative seven to both sides, we've created a problem. This is no longer how we want our linear expressions to work. But if we have something like 2x1 plus 3x2 equals 4, and then we have another linear equation, let's say negative 2x1 plus 5x2 equals 1. We could, um, we could take this equation and we can add the same thing to both sides. In particular, we could add that to the left and then add that to the right. 
And we're adding the same thing to both sides because these are equal. But because the things we're adding on the left are our x1s and our x2s, and the thing we're adding on the right is written as a number, When we do this addition, we wind up with a linear equation, just the way we want it to be written. So in this example, I didn't do any multiplication. I just added one equation to another. But also, we know that if we take an equation and multiply it by a constant, it doesn't change the equation. That's college algebra. So in this example, we could, for example, take this first equation. We could multiply it by negative 2. We'll talk about how I know to use negative two specifically later down the road. For now, this is just something we're allowed to do. We can multiply both sides of an equation by a constant and it doesn't change the solutions. Then we can take this second equation. So we multiplied the first equation by a constant. Mm -hmm. We can take the second equation and we can add the same thing to both sides. And in particular, because the th again, because the thing we're adding to both sides is written in this special way. It's got the x's on the left and it's got the constants on the right. We're going to end up with a nice linear equation. What does that give us? So we've used two equations here. We used the first one, and then we added something to the second equation. So the equation we use isn't being changed by this. I mean, because x1 plus 2x2 equals 5, it is true that negative 2x1 minus 4x2 equals negative 10, and then we can add that to the second equation, but we're not actually changing the first equation. We're, I mean, in particular, we are not replacing it with negative 2 times the first equation. The second equation is getting replaced, though. We took the second equation, we added the same thing to both sides. So we get an equivalent equation. We get an equation with the same solutions. And you can see already, even though we haven't gone through the details of, you know, how do you know which equations to do what with, but you can see that we've made our system of linear equations nicer. 
that second linear equation no longer has an x1 in it. And in fact, you can solve for x2 now. You can see that x2 must be positive 1. So that's the basics. We're going to um, take a, our systems of equations that we want to solve. We're going to manipulate them using these three allowable processes. And our goal is to wind up with a simpler system of equations that we can solve easily. However, um, there's a lot, the way, if, if we learn to do it exactly like that, there would be a lot of extraneous writing involved. Like this um, X1, this X2, we keep copying it. And we don't really need to. And that's going to bring us to the concept of matrices. And for the first section or so, matrices are just going to be a way of storing systems of linear equations compactly but uh, eventually I mean by the end of the first chapter so not in the distant future we'll start seeing applications of matrices that have nothing to do with systems of linear equations, and they'll just turn into their own thing that we can study and get interesting and useful results from. But for now, we're going to use matrices to store systems of linear equations. And what I was trying to get at when I said, well, we keep writing x1 and x2, but we don't really care about them, is that when you're solving equations or solving systems, I mean, what you, what you call your variables doesn't matter. I mean, who x1 plus x2 equals seven, 3x1 minus x2 equals 4 versus x plus y equals 7. 3x minus y equals 4 versus uh, 2x plus y equals 7 versus 2r plus s equals 7, 3r minus s equals 4. These three systems of equations are going to have the same solutions. The fact that we're giving, and, rem and because remember, a solution is just a list of numbers. And this solution is going to be the same. This list of numbers is going to be the same, no matter what we're calling our variables. So what matters here? I mean, if we say that, you know, the names of the variables don't matter. What does matter? Well, the two in front of the x1 matter. 
numbers. I mean, if we turn this two into a three, that would give us different solutions. This, although I don't have it written in, this one in front of the X two matters, and this seven matters. And this three matters, this negative one matters, that four matters. So when we look at the stuff that that's really important, we wind up with these rectangular arrays of numbers. And a rectangular array of numbers is called a matrix, which is English language has many quirks. It is not pluralized matrices. It is pluralized matrices. And um, really that's all a matrix is. It um, It's awkward though. I mean, if you have two matrices next to each other, it's gonna be sort of hard to distinguish where one ends and the other begins. So when we work with matrices, we surround them either with closed brackets, or open parentheses. And ordinarily in mathematics, if you have different notation, it, it means something. But here it really is just up to the personal preference of whoever's writing at the time. There is no difference between a matrix surrounded with closed brackets and a matrix surrounded with open parentheses. They're exactly the same. So it's easy to imagine, I mean, I say we'll do it at the end of chapter one, but we can do it now. It's completely trivial to imagine matrices that have nothing to do with systems of linear equations. I mean, your grades in Canvas are stored in a matrix. Um, an image file is stored in a matrix where each entry of the matrix is a color code from zero to 256, telling you how to color a specific pixel. So we want to be able to easily talk about um, you know, does this matrix come from a system or doesn't it? An augmented matrix is a matrix that's storing a system of linear equations.
So your grade book, for example, and I mean, just, just so that we're definitely clear, I mean, the reason this is a matrix is that you can have every student in the class as a row of the matrix, and you can have every homework assignment as a column of the matrix. And then if we have an eight here, that means student two got an eight on the second homework assignment. Um, so again, this is, an, this is not a, um, an augmented matrix. I totally forget what started that tangent. Um, well, it, it needed to be said, so no problem, I guess. Um, often augmented matrices have slightly different notation from non-augmented matrices. Our textbook doesn't do that, but Let's talk about it at least a little. So you think of a system of linear equations and you say, okay, I can store this as a matrix. I don't really care that I'm calling the variable x1. I've got two in front of the first variable, and then below it, I've got five in front of the first variable. So in the matrix, This two and this five are corresponding to the same variable. And then I don't really care that I'm calling the second variable x2. I've got four times the second variable, and I've got negative seven times the second variable. So the four and the negative seven correspond to variables. And then I don't really need to bother writing the equality because every linear equation has an equality sign in the same place. So I just need to store the seven and the zero And the seven and the zero correspond to something different. They don't correspond to a variable. They correspond to what's on the right of the equal sign. And a lot of textbooks and resources, not, uh, not David Lay, but to recognize the fact that that last column is different from the other columns, they'll put a dotted line separating the last column. Um, sort of, I guess, finishing out this picture, we now know what the columns correspond to, variable, variable, equality. The rows correspond to equations. This first row says twice the first variable and four times the second variable equals seven. Five times the first variable plus negative seven times the second variable 
equals zero. And that way of thinking that when you have an augmented matrices, the rows are columns, sorry, what? The rows are equations and the columns are variables except for the last column, which means something else is going to be helpful as we progress through this course. And I guess, by the way, I should, since I've used the word, just to make sure everyone is on the same page, rows are horizontal, columns are vertical, and I mean, this is using these words very much in their standard English sense. You talk about, you know, the column of a, a Greek uh, temple. It's a vertical thing. Let's also use the opportunity to talk about dimension. So a matrix is just a rectangular array of numbers. It can have a different, however many rows. It can have however many columns. When we talk about the size of the matrix, we use the word dimension, although it seems like size would do just as well. Anyway, dimension is always given in the same format, the number of rows first, x, the number of columns. So what we have here is a two by three matrix. Tricks. Any questions so far? Um, I did want to ask about the, I guess, some manipulation from earlier. Do you only, or not only, do you always multiply the first equation and then add the second one, or does it matter which order you go in? Um, so... We're, when we actually get to the process, what we're going to see is that, I, I mean, technically it doesn't matter, but in practice, we're always going to be multiplying the top equation and then adding it to equations below. Um, so speaking of that, where ta we talked about manipulating systems of equations, and then we said, okay, these systems of equations can be stored as matrices. Mm -hmm. So we're not going, I mean, the picture I've sort of drawn for us is that we have a system and we mess around with it. Until we get a simpler system. But the way this is going to happen in practice is that we're going to have a system We are going to store the system as a matrix instead of messing around with the system. We will mess around with the simpler matrix. And then we'll rewrite that simpler matrix as a system again. So we take a kind of circuitous route 
But I mean, the benefit is that it matrices are going really are easier to manipulate than systems. I mean, you're literally writing half as much, less than half as much, because mm -hmm. you're not trying to keep track of variable names that don't actually matter. So, When I, when I present the so-called elementary row operations, there are hopefully there's going to be recognition that elementary row operations are that we can swap two rows, we can multiply all the numbers that in a row by a non-zero constant. So intuition, what's the third one going to be? Wouldn't it be to add? To add. To, it, it's, the, it's the precise mirror of what we said we can do with, um, with equations, we can multiply a row by a constant and add it to a different Row. And I mean, the elementary row operations, um, when I say we can do something, I mean, if we take an image file and we swap rows and multiply rows by constants, we're going to change the image. What I'm trying to get at is the following definition theorem pair. Definition. Two matrices are What, uh, what's up with Zoom today? It's kind of annoying. Two matrices are row equivalent if we can use elementary row operations to turn one into the other. So, um, One, four, two, three. Oh. 
four, six, one, four, our row equivalent. Because swapping rows, writing the rows in a different order, is an elementary row operation. And then multiplying that first row by two is another elementary row operation. Sometimes you'll see um, these row operations annotated like this, just a quick note that what we're doing here is taking the first row and multiplying it by two. And because we turned one matrix into the other matrix using these elementary row operations, these matrices are called row equivalent. And then theorem two row equivalent augmented matrices have the same solution sets. I'm stating this slightly informally. I mean, you can say a matrix is just an array. It doesn't have solutions, but an augmented matrix corresponds to a system of linear equations, and that does have solutions. So I hope this slightly informal statement is still clear. And that brings us to the end of 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, my I apologize. I know this uh, 75 minute twice a week schedule can be a little hard on people, but we're going to just end this video and then go right on to the next section.